um, <laughs> interruption. Um, but yeah, um, for anyone who's just joining us again, welcome to the Create Space Public Art Forum keynote address with Lori Blondeau. My name is Belinda Wase. I'm really honored to be hosting this tonight and I'm very excited for this talk. This forum fosters connections and provides emerging equity seeking artists with the skills, relationships and support needed to develop public art practices. We also invite you to explore the upcoming 2022 Create Space Public Art Residency Call to Artists this national public art program designed in collaboration with advisors from coast to coast provides emerging black, indigenous and racialized artists with the skills, relationships and practical experiences needed to build and advance public art practices. There's also a link to the applications that will be popped into the chat so you can click on that. Firstly, before I begin, I wish to acknowledge the continual occupation of stolen land with which I am currently on is Treaty 6 territory, a traditional meeting ground and home for many diverse Indigenous peoples. The footsteps of the Cree, Salto, Nisitapi, Métis, and Nakota Sioux people have marked this land for centuries. And while I recognize that this land acknowledgement is just the beginning of an ongoing journey of learning and unlearning, I am to work and live in solidarity with the indigenous people of this land in the process of decolonization. It is crucial to understand our history and therefore I invite these ancestors in the room with us today. Moreover, as a representative of STEPS, I hereby acknowledge the sacred land on which we operate out of and where many of us are meeting from today. Te Coronto has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years and is still home to many indigenous people. As a public arts organization that recognizes our privilege while working on stolen land, we value respectful collaboration with all the indigenous people of Turtle Island who have lived on this land and for thousands of years and continue to be our neighbors, friends and colleagues. Now, we recognize that this is a virtual event because these are the times and we reside in different places, but we encourage you to take a moment to learn more about the traditional, traditional territories upon which you all reside. And we've also put a resource link in the chat to learn about that. All right, so now for the introduction, Lori Blondeau is a Cree Salto Métis artist from Saskatchewan who is currently based on Treaty 1 territory the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Diné peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Since the 1990s, Blondeau's artistic practice in the fields of performance, photography, and installation, along with her curatorial work and activities as co-founder and executive director of the Indigenous Art Collective Tribe, has provided has proved decisive to the ever increasing centrality of indigenous art and knowledge production in Canada. With her performances, which include Are You My Mother, Sisters and States of Grace and photographic work, including Cosmos Clau, Lonely Surfer Clau and Asinyi Iskew, Blondo's practice both as solo artist and in collaboration with fellow visual artists demonstrate a clarity of focus, which is remarkable for its precision, humor and strength. Her photographic and installation work has been exhibited in group and solo exhibitions. Her performance pieces have been showcased at Nuit Blanche, Vivo, Art Gallery of Ontario, and the 2007 Venice Biennale. Blondeau has participated in panel discussions and given lectures at the AGO, the University of Saskatchewan, and the IAIA Museum of Contemporary Native Arts, and the 2020 Sydney Biennale. Since 2018, Blondeau has been an assistant professor of Indigenous art at the University of Manitoba School of Art, and Blondeau was a recipient of the 2021 Governor General's Award in Visual and Media Arts. So without further ado, I'm going to give Lori the floor and thank her for joining us today. I work on Zoom all the time and it's just like unmute. Thank you, Belinda, and thank you, Colin, and uh, the organization for inviting me to do this keynote um, about public art. So I'm going to do my best. Um, I come from Treaty 4, which is 
spans across the southern part of Saskatchewan into a little bit of Alberta and a little bit of Manitoba. Um, my mother's from George Gordon First Nation, and my father is was my late father is Métis uh, from the Brat Saskatchewan in the Capel Valley. Uh, so I'm going to start off by showing a video of documentation of an exhibition that I had uh, opened February last year in um, here in Winnipeg at the Plug-in uh, Art Gallery. And it was comprised of older work. So I considered it a survey exhibition. It was curated by Nazrin. Uh, Hamadid, who was uh, who was the curator at the time, and I also was commissioned to create a new installation. Um, so I'm going to start the video now, and it's about seven minutes. And while the video is playing, I'm going to um, I'm going to read a little bit. Uh, so share screen. I don't know if that's is. I don't, oh, I'm trying to go full screen. Sorry. There we go. And there's no audio to this. Storytelling has influenced every aspect of my practice and makes up for a lot of what I produce visually. I take the stories, whether they are old stories, contemporary, and make them into visual culture. I see what I do in my practice as high-tech storytelling in contemporary times. As an artist who is Indigenous woman, I cannot help but not be influenced by the stories of the day and how it impacts my worldview. Sorry, it, uh, Lori. Oh, don't you're not seeing the video. Oh. Sorry. Sorry. Can you see it now? Yeah. Okay, I don't know if I can read. <laughs> I should be able to show the video and read at the same time. Um, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to read my artist statement, but it's all right. So anyway, um, the images of the Indian princess and the squaw, which have been stereotypes of Indigenous women since the colonization of the Americas. Um, I take these images and I try to unpack them and then recreate something that is absurd, as absurd as the stereotypes are. I create these images because they're, the stereotype is still being created of the indigenous woman across North America. You can see these images being sold in souvenir shops, in um, kitsch shops, and it has had a huge impact on me as an indigenous person, and especially as an indigenous woman growing up in Saskatchewan. I also come from what I consider a matriarch on my mother's side who is Korean Soto. And I grew up urban, I never grew up on the reserve, but I spent a lot of time on the reserve with my grandparents. And there was a very, growing up in the 60s and 70s as a young girl, um, in Saskatchewan was very informing, I think, for me as a young person because of the racism and having to deal with the racism that was very directed as at Indigenous people and still is today, I think, across the country. We just have to look at the inquiry into the missing and murdered Indigenous women, um, the Truth and Reconciliation, which is ongoing and you know 
this summer is just an example of, of what the legacy that the residential schools have had on Indigenous people. My mother went to residential school. I consider myself uh, first generation non-residential school. <clears throat> and the graves, you know, that have been found of the children that passed away and just how it was genocide towards my people and stripped any culture from them that they had, whether it's their language or the ceremonies or the dancing. Uh, so a lot of my artwork really is informed by my mother and my father, who is Métis, because Métis people too um, were so disenfranchised and still are today, I think, in a lot of ways, um, to the point of where some Métis people denied their culture because of, after 1885, which was the resistance that happened in, in Saskatchewan. And that's when I think Indigenous people were, Métis people especially, were very disenfranchised to the point of denying their own heritage and their own nationhood. Um, as Belinda introduced me, she named some of the work that I've made. Um, in 1996, I made a piece called, well, this is the Lonely Surfer Squaw. And the other piece I made was called um, Cosmo Squaw. And growing up on the prairies and probably in Canada, um, I grew up being called like an ugly squaw, a dumb squaw, you know, every derogatory term that you could put with squaw. And when I made Cosmo Squaw, I um, did some research into where the name squaw came from. And it was also informed by my grandmother, who was Cree, and she spoke, her first language was Cree. Um, and I remember I was 16 and I went home and I was upset and I lived in Regina, I grew up in Regina because I was hanging out with my friends who were mostly white girls and we were hanging out in a popular kind of teenage place to hang out in Regina, which was Wascana Park and this guy who was really far away from me called me a fucking ugly squaw. Um, so doing the research into the word uh, really made me try and dig and find out where the word was derived from and what language, because I had a feeling that it came from an Indigenous language, but wasn't sure. And from the research I did, I found out that it comes from the Rappahannock people, which are from um, the eastern coast of like around New York and a bit further down, which in Virginia, and which makes sense because they were the first contacted when it came to um, contact with white people and settlers. And I think in the beginning, they took the word and it, it did, it just meant woman. But as colonization swept westward, and especially into the plains, because we were the last people, uh, indigenous people that were colonized, and we fought, hence the resistance of 1885, and Louis Riel, who's the founder of Manitoba, and who was actually hung for treason um, and arrested after the resistance that took place at Batosh, Saskatchewan. Um, and so I, I just think as colonization swept into the West, there was more resistance from Indigenous people because I think we realized what was going to happen to us. And I think the word squaw became, I don't know if I want to say like bastardized, and it became derogatory because now we then were probably called dirty squaws, ugly squaws. And so that's why I use the word. And I'm not gonna say that I'm reclaiming the word because I'm not. I am using, because I don't think we have to as indigenous people reclaim our language, but I'm repurposing a word 
that became bastardized, <clears throat> but also comes from an indigenous language. And I wanted to um, contextualize the word in more, would I say positive light? And then cosmos, when you put cosmos with squaw, and it's also a parody of Cosmopolitan magazine, which has a horrible history of not really having women of color, or even in, I don't even know if they've had an indigenous woman on their cover to date. But when I made the piece in 1996, I think at that point, maybe there was one black model who was on the cover. And so it was just like wanting to um, make a indigenous Cosmosquaw magazine or Cosmopolitan magazine. And putting the word cosmos with squaw means, you know, you're one, like cosmos meaning the universe and squaw meaning woman. So we're universal um, women. And as Cree and Soto people, we have our stories of creation, which really talk about um, our creation stories are about that we come from the stars. We're star people. And I think a lot of indigenous nations, because there's many, many, many nations in North America, I think over 500 or over 400, there's a lot. And um, I think the majority of our nations have creation stories that are that we all come from the stars. So, um, so now I'm gonna try share my screen again and hopefully um, talk about public art because ultimately um, I, I, I have, I guess I've had public art like in the last couple of years, I've had to really think about um, public art and what it means because if you if you look at the world in Western art history, public art really is about colonialism, and it's really about these bronze monuments that are of like queens, um, prime ministers, uh, you know these these people that colonized my people. And I think we, in the last year, we have seen amazing things happening um, with the Black Lives Matter and with the rise of um, indigenous people, especially when the 215 graves were found in Kamaloops at the residential school and the stuff that just took place in the summer of the removal of some of these monuments that really represent to us as Indigenous people colonization. And in the news, like we could just see them being toppled, you know, and everybody was excited. Well, I was excited. I don't know if ever, I don't know if the government was too excited. And in Winnipeg, uh, when they toppled Queen Victoria, who was the queen at the time when the treaties, well, my treaty, treaty four, treaty one, she was, she was the queen. And we used to, our people, my people, a lot of people, indigenous people used to call her um, the great white grandmother. And so when that was toppled in front of the legislative building in Winnipeg, it was quite amazing um, to watch. And then there were in the back of, um, I don't know if it's, it was in the back, but there was also a monument of Queen Elizabeth, who is now our queen. Um, because as treaty people, we have this relationship with the crown of England. And that's how we look at our treaties. It's a nation to nation treaty. We didn't sign the treaty with Canada. We signed the treaty with the queen, the, the queen of England. So as indigenous people, we have this kind of really weird um, relationship with the crown. 
Um, but it, and the, it's weird in the way because, you know, we have to acknowledge her because that's who our treaties were signed with. Um, so back to public art and um, me as an artist trying to figure out what public art was, because a couple of years ago, I started being contact, hey, you should submit a, a proposal for this public art piece that is being commissioned. And I was just like, no, I don't make public art. Like, you know, I had to really wrap my head around what public art was. And I didn't consider myself as a person who made public art. So this image that you see here is from my series. It's a four images. It's called Isinia Squale, which in Cree is in Cree, and it translates to rock woman. And this piece I made in 2016. And it was inspired by an incident that happened in Saskatchewan in 1966. The Saskatchewan government, and it was a year before, I guess, the centenary in 1967, Canada was going to be, I don't know, 50 years old or older than that, but anyway. Um, so there was all these, I guess, infrastructure that was going on and they decided to dam the South Saskatchewan River, which runs through Saskatchewan, like it runs through, El comes, there's the North Saskatchewan River and the Southern Saskatchewan River, and it comes from the mountains and then it spills into the Cinnaboyne River, which it's part of our major river system in the in the prairies. And they decided to uh, dam this river, and just southeast of Saskatoon, about an hour south, um, there was a huge gathering place for the Cree, Soto, Assiniboyan and probably Dakota, Lakota people that we, are, we would gather in the summer. And it was a huge valley. It was like, you know, part of the river valley of the South Saskatchewan River. And we, it was a gathering spot because there was what we call a buffalo stone, which is like a medicine stone where we would do our ceremonies. And this stone was huge. It was probably about 17 feet high and I, I can't remember the diameter of it but it was quite quite big you know um, and uh, the government decided that they wanted to blow up this medicine stone and even up to 1966 when they made the decision like our my people were still doing ceremony around this stone and um, there was protests that went on and uh, Buffy St. Marie actually came and protested. Um, Wilford Tatusis, uh, he's now passed away, but he was, he was a real advocate for the stone. And what ended up happening, they couldn't, they, the government blew it up in the middle of the night. So nobody was there. And then they ended up damming the river and then they opened up the dam, which then created a lake called Diefenbaker Lake. And the dam is called the Gardner Dam. And <clears throat> what they ended up doing was uh, the government, because of the pressure from Wilford Tatusis and other people, was they saved a shard of, of um, it was called Mistassini, the rock which means little boy, and they saved part of it. And they made a monument at Elbow, Saskatchewan, and that's where the Cinnaboy and Saskatchewan River come together. That's why it's called Elbow. And they made a monument with the stone in the middle, and then on each side, they made cairns with plaques on them, one in Cree and one in English that tell the story of Mistassini. Uh, not that they blew it up, but why this stone was so significant to us. So this 
series of um, that I did was inspired by that. So can you see my cursor? Yeah. So this image here is in front of Lake, Lake Diefenbaker. So the rest of Mistassini is somewhere under that water. Um, this image on this side is from, it was taken in BC. So what I ended up doing was trying to give because rocks are so powerful for us as Indigenous people. That's why we had medicine wheels. We had, you know, I look at our rock art and our ceremonial rocks as history keepers. We call them um, grandfathers. And so two of the images for this series, because there's four, um, I'm going to try pull up the... the images, sorry. Zoom can be fun and it can also be a pain. Yeah. So, sorry, I should have opened these before, but I didn't. No, that's all good. Okay, so this, I'll show you all four of the images. So this is the piece of mystacity that they kept. So you can imagine how big the original rock was. And this is in, just on a rock in front of where the dam, where they open up the dam. And they took a lot of stones and piled them up. So, and that's Lake Diefenbaker, the pretend lake. Sorry. We don't see the image. Oh, you don't see the image. No. You're just seeing the other one. Okay, let's start over. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So this is the image with the shard that they saved from Mistassini. And, um, you know, like it's quite huge. Um, this is the one in front of the Lake Diefenbaker. And then I just ended up doing some, I was in a residency at UBC, uh, Kelowna. And so I just found um, places that I wanted to, uh, I thought they were gonna be test shots, but I ended up keeping them because I thought they were, um, there was something beautiful about them and they just fit in with the series. So these rocks were just landscaping rocks because they were doing all this building at UBC in Kelowna at the time. And so like, there's nothing sacred about them or, but I, to me, rocks, all rocks are pretty sacred. I think if the rocks could speak, we would know history way better than we learn from Western historians. And this was also in Kelowna, just a huge rock that I had found. So, um, sorry, I'm gonna go back to that other image. No worries. Can you see the rocks? Yeah. Okay. So I was invited to the contact festival, the Scotiabank contact festival in 2017. And the curator said, I would like to curate your work with the stones and I, this is outside of University X, they call it, but it used to be Ryerson. Uh, and there's a pond, like a man-made pond with these also shards of the, um, sorry, I'm just kind of losing my thought here. These are shards. These rocks are actually just pieces of the, how come I can't remember the word for it? The shield, the Canadian shield that they had brought in and placed them around the front of University X. And 
Um, by the way, Ryerson, his monument was also pulled down. So, <laughs> um, and she wanted to put my images on the shards of the Canadian shield. And it was interesting because I thought, oh, I said that that'll work. And the material we used was 3M. Um, it's kind of like that same stuff they wrap cars in when they build them and ship them. It's like they had to apply heat in order to make this material stick to them, which is really great material. Like I was just like so amazed about it. And um, so she only used three images. So these two, and then the one of me on the actual shard of Mistassini. And she didn't use the fourth one because there was not another big enough rock to at least show most of the images. And then this pond was supposed to be filled with water, which it was for one day. Um, and I'm gonna show a really bad image of the pond was filled with water because it it they had to unfill it because it was um leaking underneath somehow do you see the image i don't see the image we see it oh, okay so you can see the sorry it's a bad image it's really small i just pulled it off the internet but um I was excited because the pond would be filled and then I thought about the reflection and this piece actually made me start thinking about, oh, I guess I do kind of make public art. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and it, it, you know, they were up for about three months. Um, and I think why part of the reason Colin invited me to do the keynote for this is because there was an article that came out in the Toronto Star uh Colin was it like two years ago I think so yeah I'll, I'm, I'm gonna put the link in the chat too yeah so the article was about rethinking public art but before that I was starting to think okay well I kind of make public art and I I love the idea that um the reflection and just what was happening with the piece and where it was installed and um <clears throat> the pond was only filled up for one day, which a real um, made me sad. But I had a friend that actually worked at University X, and he he sent me some photos he took with his phone of the pond being um, filled that one day. And then I was worried because I was thinking, because usually when in the spring or whenever skateboarders go in skateboard in this pond, because it's not very deep, right? Like maybe 12 inches. So, you know, they skateboard. Oh, wow. And um, so with I, knowing that there wasn't going to be any water in the pond, I thought, oh my God, are people going to pick at the images, you know, because it's this plastic and but people didn't and I had people emailing me and texting me saying I went by your piece this evening and it was so great because there was all these people sitting in little groups in the pond that had no water around your pieces and just you know having socially gathering um so thinking about public art like this piece really made me realize, okay, I can make public art. Um, and then another piece that I had made um, uh, that I also consider, because I do performance art too, and I'm I, switching the way I think about public art um, and thinking about my history when in Saskatoon in the early 90s, uh, when we founded um, Tribe, we um, were a group of performing art performance artists, and we were just we had no space, so we would just go perform on Twentieth Street, which was a very big street that was important to um, Saskatoon at the time, especially for Indi Indigenous people, and we wanted to perform for Indigenous people because we were all indigenous and that's who we wanted to speak to. Um, so we would just do street performances 
you know, and then we thought like, no, we need to, we need to go and take up space in, you know, in other galleries. So that's kind of was tribe's philosophy. We never had a gallery space, but we, we, um, we would take over uh, other people's galleries and present shows. Um, oh, maybe I don't have Grace in here. Sorry. Oh, that's weird. I don't have it. Hmm. In the video, it's it's a piece where I did a performance in. Um, In Venice, I did it for five days at sunrise and at sunset every day during the Venice Biennale. And um, maybe I can show you from the video. Um, and it was a story of death and um, birth and almost death. Okay. And it was amazing because I didn't think people, because, you know, I'm, okay, just making sure that's not moving, um, that people wouldn't understand, right? Because they're Italian, like in my audio was in English, but people actually got it because, um, because of the subject matter that I was dealing with, which was, they understood. So it's this piece, which I considered this as a public art piece. And this was in the morning. And it was interesting to do a performance piece that was at sunrise and sunset because every day sunrise would change, you know, time by a couple minutes. And then, sunset the same thing but i use these candles which are like you know candles that you would put at um at a cemetery and so that is what made the italian people really get the piece because you know they they knew what the what the candles represented and we also got my audio translated where I tell these seven stories for a birth, two of death and one of almost death. And I was sort of thinking about um, time and not analog time or Western time, but just how my people probably thought of time. And that's why I decided to do it at sunrise and sunset because we didn't, you know, we didn't keep time the way that society keeps time today. And I was thinking about how that moment of when somebody dies and that moment of when somebody is born, that's where time becomes warped at that moment when somebody dies and when somebody's born. And, um, and it was, it came out of a story like it, I have four children who are all adults now, but it was, so the birthing stories were my stories. And then at the time, I didn't know there was death a lot, you know, how we go through, sometimes there's, you know, a lot of people who die all at once or, and I was going through a period when I was making this piece, which took a couple of years to, you know, make and conceive of. And I had death around me and I had a couple friends who had been with people when they passed like two stories. And one was my aunt and it was my uncle, her husband had, who was my mother's brother, had died in a horrible car accident. And it was my aunt who was driving. And so, and I just remember her telling me the story of you know, how it happened. And then my other very good friend who I grew up with, he was with his mother when she took her last breath. And then 
during this all happened in these two years when I was making the piece. And then my father almost like he was on life support for two and a half months. So he almost died. Um, so it's a piece about time, death, and um, birth. And it's about time. And I called it grace because the word for me, and as you saw in the video on the side of the wall, there was um, uh, the definition from the dictionary of what grace means. So you see here on this side. And um, the word grace, uh, I don't know, I just, I came across the definition of it and I just thought, oh, grace. So it's this word that has dichotomy, like you can either fall from grace or walk in grace. Um, grace is also, you know, could be a name and it's just the meaning of it, which is so packed with these kind of colliding ideas of what grace means. And it's very religious also. So that's sort of where that piece comes from. And so these two pieces are pieces that I really believe are public art or whatever, you know, I think today we just have to, we think differently about what um, public art is. So this is my journey discovering that um, I, I guess I make public art and I'm looking forward to exploring that. I haven't not applied for um, a public art piece as of yet, um, but I think I'm gonna think about that more. So that's my journey of um, public art. Lovely, thank you. That was amazing. All right, um, yeah, I think we're ready to take questions now. I don't think I missed any in the chat, but feel free to still pop them in there if you have any. I'm seeing some comments come in of people saying, thank you. I saw Miranda said she really enjoyed learning about the rich history and background of your piece. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions for Lori at this time, please feel free to ask them now. More questions or more, sorry, more comments saying thank you. Or maybe somebody can share with us their thoughts about. Yes, for sure. If you have thoughts, feel free to. Somebody raised, Liz raised her hand. Hi, um, sorry about that. Can do you want Liz to go first and then I'll go? Because I actually have some compliments to make for your artwork. Uh, sure, you go because you're already talking. Okay, so I think your artwork is very symbolic and it's fantastic. The fact that, you know, you have yourself standing on the rocks with like this, you know, this red tape or whatever you call it, right? Mm -hmm. It's very powerful and it speaks a lot to, you know, what you went through in your interpretations. And I just think it's amazing. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Yeah, I think we'll go, Liz. Go. Um, hi, thank you so much for the presentation, Lori. Um, I really enjoyed the narrative about how people were just kind of like sitting around your piece and spending time with it and with each other. I wonder, like, is that kind of an idea of what it means to meaningfully engage with indigenous narratives and artwork? Because I find that it's very difficult for me to try and, and learn about it more um, in a way that doesn't come off as appropriation as well, or trying to be um, respectful, at least, of, of cultures that are not my own. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, of course. Like the stories that I was getting through emails and people texting me that would go and see it and just seeing how... Um, I think the majority of my friends that I, that were texting me and telling me, they just said like pe people were just so respectful of them and they never got picked at until the end. Somebody, um, in one of the big rocks. And I think it had the image of me standing on Mistassini, the shard of Mistassini. Um, you could see where they had drilled holes into the Canadian shield to 
probably put dynamite to blow it up to get these big shards. Because I also did a little bit of um, research into why those rocks were there. And that's how I found out that they were pieces from the Canadian Shield. But it was on, on that image because there was a like a perfect circle and somebody started picking the circle and it wasn't until the end. So, so um, I think if you want to engage, you just have to ask and don't feel, um, you know, like you can't because people like to share, so. Yeah. Um, I think we had another question from Ehiko. Hi, Lori, it's really nice to meet you. Um, I really enjoyed this um, talk because I could resonate a lot with what you were saying, especially with the history aspect of it. Um, my work is also centered around um, decolonization and returning back to like our roots. And for me, I think my question is sometimes like, cause I'm Nigerian, but like even in Nigeria, we have sub tribes and because of colonization, we have a lot of history lost, especially from my tribe, the Udoma people and trying to make art based off of where I came from can be hard because most of the information has been erased and you can't really find it online. So I think my question is, how do you um, go about your research when it's hard to find like the resources to help, you know, find even learn more, if that makes sense? Yes, totally makes sense. Thank you. I, I think a lot of my research can be either based on archives because that's how, like how I found out about Mistassini being blown up was just a story I grew up with. Like we knew about it and we knew what happened. My grandfather um, who was Soto, uh, like spent a lot of my summers, you know, on the reserve with my grandparents and he was a dancer and he was a ceremonial person so you know we just grew up within that culture and it was like in the summertime right when we were on summer holidays and so it starts with stories and then I think as I grew up um now that I'm you know a grown-up <laughs> I uh I go to archives now and then I did find uh an article um in a newspaper the Star Phoenix from 1966 that talked about the blowing up of the stone. And then somebody had told me who was also, she was Cree, Tasha Hubbard, who's a filmmaker. And she told me that, you know, you should go to Albo because there's actual shard of Mistassini there. Cause I was telling her about my projects. So, you know, it's just talking to people and archives and in Canada, the archives about Indigenous people, yeah, like it's very, you kind of got to wade through it because you, you don't know what part of these archives are true because, you know, they're coming from a colonial settler point of view. Okay. And, but I think the archives for Indigenous people in Canada are especially the Métis people because you know they were disenfranchised completely and same with the Inuit people and um those records are all kept in the archives especially here in Winnipeg especially for the Métis people so archives and stories that's why I say my practice is story-based and I grew up with a lot of stories like some of the stories I grew up with I think the oldest one comes from when my great great grandfather, and this would have been, he would have been born maybe early 1800s before the even the treaties existed, um, when he was a boy. And, you know, like they're just stories that we, we are story based people. So, yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, just as Lori said, feel free to raise your hand if you just want to share any thoughts. We also have another question from Leah who wants to know 
What do you think makes public art different or unique from your other practice? That it can be out in the public where people who don't go to galleries can see it. <laughs> and I think it, it public art puts art into the general public because not everybody goes to art galleries, right? And especially, you know, for a long time, indigenous people rarely went to art galleries. I, I was lucky, I grew up in a family of artists and I have a brother who's 12 years older than me and he's pretty, he taught art in the 80s, 70s, late 70s and 80s. So I grew up where, you know, there's a lot of indigenous people would never, like even when we started Tribe in 1995, um, and as part of the reason we chose not to get a gallery because we wanted to take up space in other people's galleries because we knew um, not a lot of indigenous people were going to galleries because they just weren't, and a lot of people of color weren't going to galleries, you know? So I think public art in that way, it exposes everybody to, to art in a way that I think a gallery can't do. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Yeah, anyone have any more thoughts, questions? Just want to share something, feel free. Is anybody, oh, sorry. No worries. Um, well, that looks like a long question from Christian. I'll just read it out. Just wondering if you could share more about what you think about the engagement with the public. How do you select your public? How do you decide the type of message or reaction you'd like to get from the public? I always say that I make my art for my people, which are indigenous people. But I also understand as a contemporary artist that those sometimes indigenous people not, might not see my work, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think as an artist making work, that's who I think of initially. And I think it's because that's where my knowledge comes from, is from uh, indigenous worldview. And, but, I'm very practical and I understand that, you know, that's not, might not be who my audience is. But I also know that I have to, I want to engage non-Indigenous people. So, you know, um, so I begin just from that perspective. And then I also understand that, you know, like who's not going to laugh at, an indigenous woman in a fur bikini in the snow with a surfboard, you know, <laughs> like it's kind of absurd, right? So um, I think it's important to really try know who your audi audience is as an artist, but you sometimes, you, you know, it, it, you're not gonna know who that audience is. Like when I went to Venice, I knew the majority of my audience is going to be Italians, right? And um, I wasn't, I was really, uh, the first time I, because I've performed in Italy a couple of times, the first time was in Milan. And the piece that the curator wanted me to perform is called Sisters. And in the video, you saw me where I was crushing berries on rocks. Um, that piece is called Sisters, and it's three actions. I crush berries, I gut a fish, and I rip cloth, and it's being projected. And then after I'm done these three actions, I move to another space, place, space, uh, another place in the space, and I eat, I think it's 14 McDonald's cheeseburgers out of a lunchbox. I really don't eat all of them <laughs> I, and they're gross. It actually got my children who are, like I said, are now adults 
they they stopped eating McDonald's after they saw me wow. do that. Piece. Um, and it was oh, sorry to interrupt you about the McDonald's. I don't eat fast food either. And speaking of, um, you know, fast food, I can't really eat it that often because I have anxiety. And mm -hmm. when I eat all the processed foods, it will actually exacerbate my anxiety. It will worsen the symptoms. So I'm, I'm starting this journey of not just to manage my anxiety, but to heal my anxiety. And you know, fast food is actually the worst thing to eat if you have anxiety. Oh, yeah. I've been living with the disorder since I was 11. And yeah, it's, it's one of the worst things you can feed yourself if you have anxiety. So share that with somebody who has anxiety. And <laughs> <laughs> I think I think these days everybody has anxiety because of the times we're living in. For um, sure. Yeah. But there's also a difference between the disorder itself. And yes, just I understand the, that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that's also why I do art. I do art because it helps me communicate my thoughts. Mm -hmm. I can't always communicate them with the world because I get afraid that, um, that I'm going to be criticized and judged and, you know, not accepted for who I am. So I not just express that through poetry, but through visual arts. Oh, that's, that's great. Yeah. Like visual arts is healing. Well, I, sometimes I think that's kind of corny, but it is in some ways, but I, uh, cause being an indigenous artist, you know, we get stereotyped and it's always your work about healing. Yeah. Like, any racial, I believe any racial population is very vulnerable to being racialized, to being subjected to racism. Like I have quite a few friends. I have one best friend who's indigenous. She was born in Moose Factory, a reserve. And um, I have many friends who are a part of racialized groups, LGBT, and they're very prone to bullying and harassment and discrimination. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I like to you know, learn about indigenous culture and not just because of my friend, my best friend who is indigenous herself, but I've always been into cultures. And, it, you know, when I do art and when I write foreign words in my artwork, mm -hmm. it helps me kind of appreciate the culture to really connect with the cultures that I like learning about. Like, I want to learn more about the Nunavut culture and the Inuit culture, and I want to start including some um, Inuktitut words into my artwork to really apply what I've been enjoying learning about. And I'm you, are you are you Inuit? No, I'm not Inuit. I'm Jewish. Oh, okay. But I have friends who are, yes. like I said, indigenous, and mm -hmm. I like learning about the Inuit culture, but no, I'm not Inuit myself. Okay. I, I think sometimes you have to be careful when you're incorporating uh, uh, a group of people, especially indigenous people, um, their language into your own artwork, because it could be looked at as being appropriation. Especially oh, if, you're not, okay. if you're not Inuit. Yeah. Um, so just, yeah, awesome. yeah, just be careful. I appreciate the feedback, appreciate the feedback. So what if I have a friend, you know, for example, who's Korean and I want to, you know, paint her something with a Korean word at the bottom? You should talk to your Korean friend about it. <laughs> um, and that's where dialogue with with other na nations is really important right and and just learning about what appropriation means and um you know because it, it could be a it could be a really dangerous place to go if you're okay. not from the culture that you're tr trying to represent within your visual art making I'm very, I'm very open to that feedback. I will learn more about a pre appropriation. I am, am aware of the, the term. I just don't know much about the theory itself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I appreciate the feedback. I think it's good to know because I don't want to be misinterpreted and nor to any of my other friends who come from all different 
different uh, backgrounds. So mm -hmm. it's 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 very it's helpful for for me. And I like I said, thank you. You're welcome thank you for the feedback. And Billy, I'm going to say thank you very much for pointing it out. I uh, yes, I do have good intentions, but we're not always aware of the consequences. Yeah, and I I might have some links. Um, for online information about appropriation when it comes to Indigenous work, which I will share with Colin, and then maybe he can email these articles out to you guys. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, we have a few raised hands. I think I'm going to go to Asha's comment first because it's kind of online with what we're talking about. Um, she's wondering what you think about land artists such as Robert Smithson and Andy Goldsworthy. Um, and Peter Vaughn and whether white descendants of colonizers doing land-based work is further appropriation of indigenous land. Well, I guess it depends uh, where they're doing it. I love um, some of those artists work and it depends how it's being done because the reality, this whole earth has been colonized. Like you can't go anywhere where where colonization has not happened. I think we're going through a time, especially here in Canada and maybe North America, um, and I think maybe globally, like even thinking of Australia and New Zealand. But we're going through a time of decolonizing, mm -hmm. and you know, a lot of people have a hard time understanding what decolonization is, especially if you're a settler. You know, like um, I teach at the University of Manitoba, and the students group I have been invited. Like I was one of two Indigenous people to be hired in the School of Art in 2018. And when you think of history, like that's not, that's uh, like, it blows my mind sometimes. And I tell my colleagues that like, I just, but I work with the student group um, because they want to know about what is decolonization because it, it's a big, it's a term that's hard to wrap your head around. Mm -hmm. And it means decolonizing your mind that, you know, everything that we've been taught in history has been from a colonized point of view and a colonizer's point of view and erases everything else that is not white. And so I'm not gonna apologize for using white. Um, but, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's like Talia just said, you know, like I wanna learn more and that's, that's decolonizing mm -hmm. is having those conversations. For sure. I'm going to try to go in order. If I don't, I apologize. I think Eva had raised her hand first. So we'll go to you first. Hi there. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for sharing your perspectives and your journey. That was really great talk. Um, I guess I just kind of was wondering as an artist who's been working uh, for a long time and then moving into public art, it kind of made me think when you were talking about the history of colonial uh, structures and uh, statues that was like relegated to public art. Um, it makes me think about a lot of institutions in Canada, like the library systems that are uh, making an effort to advance reconciliation by bringing in uh, indigenous public art into those spaces. And I just was really interested what uh, your thoughts would be on those kinds of like placemaking and uh, representation efforts in public art? I think they're very important and I think more have to happen because that's the, that's another way of decolonizing, right? You're decolonizing a space like even me teaching and being hired at the University of Manitoba, my body being within that institution is important because that's decolonizing. And if we don't do it, then we're just going to continue with the colonial project and I, I just think those projects are very very important and um, like I when I was telling you the story about what happened here in Winnipeg and at the legislative building when they pulled down Queen Victoria um, in the beginning the government I think the premier might have done a, a news conference and he was really appalled and you know, mad about it. 
Um, and then when they took down Queen Elizabeth, they took her head off and they threw it into the, sorry for laughing. They took her head off, which is kind of ironic and they threw it into the Cinnaboyan River. And there's photographs, somebody had photographed her head floating down the river, but, um, and they're not gonna put them back up. I'm not saying that these, um, I've had many discussions about like, well, what should we do with all these monuments that are being taken down, like of John A. MacDonald, who was one of the big um, suspects, I'd like to call him, in colonization of Canada and Canada's First Nation people. Um, like, I, I don't think they should be destroyed because that's part of history too. And if we destroy all of them, then how do how will the future generations know about what colonization was and how the whole project of colonization was um, born and became, you know? So it, it's important, but I think it's also important that we, future generations need to see what public art used to be, you know. Did, did I answer your question? Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Good question, by the way. Thank you, Eva. Um, just letting everyone know we're gonna take these last two questions and then wrap up, but thank you all for joining us. I'm gonna go to Faith. Okay. <laughs> Um, first of all, thank you, Lori, for um, sharing your work and your background with us. I really appreciate that. Um, I have a question regarding um, re-envisioning public art, especially in times like these where um, we're not really encouraged to go out as much. It's like we spend a lot more time indoors, online. Um, so what are your thoughts on how to approach the situation as young artists who want to make public art, um, what advice do you have for us? Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, here in Winnipeg, it's a real mural city. And a lot of the murals are done by young artists. So I think just pursue it. And if that's where you, how you envision whatever kind of art you wanna make, and if there's opportunities, which, here there seems to be a lot for um, a lot of young artists is we just got to keep making work like that's what we do as artists so you know just however you see it wherever you see it just do it <laughs> and have fun I, I always say, if you can't have fun making art, like why in the fuck are you doing it? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for the half ball, but <laughs> Thank that's you. my motto. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Faith. Um, all right, last question or thoughts from Brandon. Yeah, uh, thank you for the talk. It was really informative uh, and learning about the Buffalo Stone and that history and how it informed the rock women work. Uh, which I really enjoyed. Um, and then I was wondering if the Lonely Surfer Squaw was at the AGO. It, it's yeah, up right now. They just purchased. I saw it, I saw it like a month or two ago. Uh, okay. It was good, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then the image of the grace piece uh, in the slideshow I thought was really powerful. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a question about that work. Um, you said time is warped uh, when you're born and when you die. So I was just wondering like what you meant by that because I, I thought it was really insightful and deep, but like I didn't get it. So it's okay, yeah, it's 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 interesting because um I was really obsessed about time. And I think it was because my father uh had, was on life support and when he woke up after two months of being on life support, he said the thing that he hated was seeing all these clocks. So that sort of what kind of was the catalyst for that work. And then I started thinking about, you know, Western timekeeping and indigenous timekeeping because we kept time with the moon and the sun, obviously. The moon was, the moon is our calendar. There's 13 moons, not 12 months, you know. Um, and so I believe 
this is just my own theory and I don't know, maybe it has to do with quantum science or something, but I believe like when somebody is born and comes into this physical world, um, time kind of stops. Mm -hmm. And when you die, like time of what we know of time also stops where it's just like maybe kind of like a fourth dimension. Okay. Yeah, so, I, I don't know if that makes sense. No, so are you uh, saying it's more of like a spiritual thing? No, I think it's more of a quantum science thing. Okay. <laughs> I'm not uh, very well fascinated either, but um, it was a really cool thing that you said. So, yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. For the whole talk. It's really informative. Thank you. Thanks. Lovely. Yes, Perfect. great questions. That was great. Thank you guys so much for joining us. This has been amazing. Um, thank you, Lori, for sharing your work with us and for speaking on all of these and sharing all of these insightful thoughts. Um, I hope everyone learned a lot and enjoyed this conversation. And yeah. Uh, yeah, and I'll send those articles on appropriation when it comes to indigenous yeah. work to Colin yeah. and then are, most of them are online and stuff so perfect sounds great and if you go to school if you're going to university where there's an indigenous teacher i teach contemporary indigenous studio which i had to wrap my head around what that was because ultimately studio work is studio work doesn't matter what ethnicity or what culture you come from but i think the way we approach and make art is different um Take the classes, take Indigenous art history, um, you know, if you want to learn and if you're in a school and you have that opportunity, take the classes. Perfect. Well, thank you guys all so much. This has been amazing. Thank you guys. Great questions. <laughs>